Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala ekremil enbiya'i ve mursalin. Seyyidina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in. Ve ba'd. One of the things that uh, are most stressed by the scholars during the month of Ramadan is that uh, Ramadan is not just about abstaining food, drink, physical desire, smoking and the rest, but it is also about abstaining from the inner vices. To abstain outwardly without there being a natural falling away from the inward passions is to have misunderstood and to have misapplied the whole principle of fasting, which is to purify the entire human system, not just the uh, physical uh, metabolism. So, man lam yada al kadiba wa qawl al zur, falaysa lillahi hajatun fi an yada'a ta'amahu wa sharabahu. Whoever does not renounce lying and bearing false witness, Allah has no need of his renouncing food and drink. And the Holy Prophet ﷺ constantly emphasized this, that Ramadan is to be a time of real detachment from the fiery lower self, from the nafs ammara, from the false illusory sense, which is unfortunately that part of us which is most stressed by a modernity in this endless fool's errand looking for selfhood and individuality. It's a kind of mist, a cobweb. It's not really there, but it's full of fire and passion and it's dangerous. So Ramadan is a spiritual school. It is a month-long retreat. It is a time when we engage in this inward jihad. Slaughter your desires with the swords of mujahada, inward jihad. Ride the stallion of your will into the battlefield of desire until blood stains it up to the fetlocks. All of this language we find because this inner jihad, this jihad akbar, is fundamental to what this particular form of our ibadah is about. It is a spiritual school. So we find the famous hadith in which Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu an is riding behind the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, anu akhadhu bima naqool. Qal, thakalatka ummuka ya Mu'adh, wa hal yakubbu al-nasu fi al-nari ala manakhirihim illa hasa'idu al-sinatihim. So Mu'adh says, are we going to be taken to account just for the words that we say? And he says, uh, you misbegotten one, O Mu'adh. It's a strong reproach. Are people thrown down upon their forelocks in hell for anything other than what their tongues have reaped? Hmm. The tongue is qalilun uh, jurmu. Its uh, weight is little, but its potential for spreading harm is immense. And we are told in Ramadan particularly to watch out for it. One of the early Muslims used to say, Lisani sabu'un in arsaltuhu akal. My uh, tongue is like a wild beast. If I let it go, it goes and eats somebody. Uh, and the teeth are to be the tongues, the bars of the tongue's cage. And at this time of Ramadan, muraqaba and watching what the ego does with the tongue is particularly important. In another hadith, uh, one of the Sahaba asked the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, akhbirni an al-Islami bi amrin la as'alu ahadan ba'dak. Tell me about something in Islam that will be enough for me so I don't need ever to ask anybody else about it again. Qal, qul amantu billah thumma staqim. So it's a general question, so he gives them the general totalizing answer, the Jawami al kalam Say, I believe in Allah, and then go straight, be an upright Muslim. Qal, so he wants more. Fama at what should I beware of? Fa'awma abiyadihi ila lisani. 
So he said his bit, he's not going to speak again, but he points with his uh, hand to his tongue. What should I beware of? The Holy Prophet says, the tongue, watch out. And uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an once passed by Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu an, who was sitting there kind of holding his tongue, strange, literally holding his tongue. And he said, what are you doing, ya Amir al-Mu'mineen? And he said, hadha awradan al-mawarid. It is this that has got me into difficult places. And this is abundant and evident and all human experience shows that if there is suffering, it's probably because of what somebody has done. Somebody has revealed somebody's secret. Somebody has uh, engaged in slander about somebody. Somebody has engaged in gossip or loose talk, backbiting, libel, slander, the thing that our culture Hello Magazine, the tabloids, is just full of. Uh, we're all eating the flesh of our dead brothers. Uh, this is an age in which so much money is made out of gossip, celebrity gossip or the gossip we exchange amongst ourselves. And this is, in Islam, a very grave thing, that we defend the honour of other Muslims and we retain the principle of husnul zan. We give them the benefit of the doubt. Ibn Abbas radiallahu an says, even if you smell alcohol on your brother's beard, you should assume that somebody has spilt it there. Don't assume that that person is guilty of a sin. Always find some excuse. Iltimasul udr li akhika al Muslim. Find an excuse for your brother Muslim. Now, one of the most grave consequences of this uh, loose talk is when people start to engage in religious criticism of each other. And this we should definitely avoid during this fasting month. Because after all, what do we know? We ordinary Muslims who are not scholars, what do we know? The hadith, there's about a million of them. And they're difficult to understand. How are we going to know for sure who's right and who's wrong? Even the ulama have never agreed on many things as to what is right and what is wrong, and they have their different interpretations. Particularly in the early period of Islam, you find such an enormous breadth of interpretations. Uh, that becomes a little bit narrower as the years go by, but ours is a religion of ikhtilaf and, therefore, a religion in which we acknowledge that these things are difficult to understand. And who are we to say, Imam Malik is right, Imam Shafi'i is wrong, this is haram, bid'ah, all of this should stop. This mira, uh, Imam Malik used to say, in the mira alaysa min dini fi shay. Uh, this ego-based argumentativeness about religion has nothing to do with religion. Mm. And a hadith says, never was a people destroyed, illa utul jadal. Whenever a people is destroyed, it's because they're given this uh, egotistic argumentativeness, finding pleasure in poking holes in other people's arguments. This scholar is this, this scholar is that, and all of this nonsense, because who are we to point accusing fingers at the great ones of the past who'd memorized hundreds of thousands of hadiths and performed more ibadah in a year than we'll perform in our lifetime. What does it mean? It's just ego. We feel less insecure about our own weaknesses when we think, I'm better than Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. I'm better than Imam al-Ghazali. I know, I know, I know. I am Sheikh al-Islam. The self, the sovereign will, the ego prevails and becomes Qadi al-Qudat and the Grand Mufti. This is obviously the destruction of religion. And in the month of Ramadan in particular, when we are feeling a little bit broken, and when there's less energy for all of these ego things, we should be seeing those vices for what they are and be disgusted by them. What do we know? How strong are we? How long will we live? What's the point of spending so much of our time pointing out the faults of others. If it's something extreme and outrageous and destructive to the Ummah, then of course the Ummah is agreed that those things are outrageous. But most of the ikhtilaf issues in religion, these are issues on which the ulama uh, have a, a mutual respect. And one of the signs of the decadence of the Ummah is that mutual respect is going. 
the divergence between the Brelvis and the Deobandis, for instance, to the great glee of so many Hindu nationalists and others who wish ill to this Ummah, uh, is based on issues that the great ulama of the past would have regarded as legitimate areas of ikhtilaf. But you can see on all sides the, the fiery egos and the sense of self-righteousness and the passionate desire to defend a school tradition and an inherited uh, narrative blinds people to the reality of, of what is going on. So in Ramadan in particular, let's leave that aside. Let's leave that disputatiousness with our shoes outside the masjid. And when we come in to worship and when we begin the fast, uh, and when we say nawaitu siyam and the fast begins, that really means that we fast from these uh, sins of the tongue, afat al lisan so that at the end of the month, we benefit from the end of the month, the last 10 days. Uh, and the ease with which the fast presents itself in those 10 days, a very extraordinary transformation, almost a metabolic change, almost a different species. So that when the month is over, we miss so much of it and we feel that the lights have been turned out and we're in a kind of gray, neutral, meaningless space. The believer, is nostalgic for Ramadan. Everybody feels this. That as we move up to the Laylatul Qadr, as we ponder the Ru'yat al-Hilal and the joy of the Eid and the experience that is for families and friends and for the reconciling of the Ummah, that togetherness should not be a hypocritical togetherness. We should not be embracing people who we've been sitting around in the mosque before Maghrib bad-mouthing because we don't agree with their ta'wil or we think their sheikhs are upon dalala or something like that. This is not a good thing to do in the month of Ramadan. Arguments about right and wrong in Islam are for the ulama in a particular context, but they're not for us to gossip about when we know nothing at all. Only the ego, only the shaitan takes pleasure in that. And Ramadan is not the appropriate time. So in this fasting month, let's try and keep that wild beast locked up where it belongs. Let us consider, before we say anything at all, what we are saying, why we are saying it. Is it to impress somebody? Is it to impress ourselves? Is it because we wish to feel superior to somebody? Is it because we wish to feel that we are better than a whole bunch of Muslim scholars? What is the reason? And when we look at it, honestly, we will see that it is an ugly thing and unworthy of this great and dignified and holy month. When we should be hearing the angels and our voices should be like the angels and we should be listening only to Qur'an and only to good things and shutting out all of the pollution that comes out of the, the minds of, 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 and the mouths of, of human beings. This should be a time of purity and a time of turning and a time of repentance, not a time of pride and superiority. So at this time, in these blessed days, as the month winds down and as the sand moves out of the hourglass and we face the Eid and we face the return to what we take to be normality, let it be a time of contrition, a time of tawbah, a time in which we recognize that we need less. We need less talk, we need less food, we need less drink, we need less sleep. We overindulge always, and this is spiritually as well as physically bad for us. And also the Ummah is terribly torn and divided. The Ummah, which is the pride of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and for all of which he will intercede, is wounded and besmirched by these divisions that are now tearing Muslims apart in so many places. Ramadan should be the time when we fix that. It should be the laboratory of the soul. It should be a psychology clinic where we try and look within ourselves to see what we do that contributes either to the unity or the disunity of the Ummah, either to the uh, joy or the rage of Islam's enemies, because our disunity always pleases our enemies. It doesn't please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't please the angels, it doesn't please the ulama and the awliya. So let this be a time where our embraces on the Eid are sincere and where the singularity of the Ummah in the ibadah on the day of Eid is an inner as well as an outward reality because these are difficult times. We are weak. We should not be adding to that weakness by 
unnecessarily and in an ugly and egotistic fashion, uh, fashion running each other down. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala return to this ummah the unity which is what the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed for. May we be a united ummah, shuhada'a ala nas, witnesses to and for and against mankind uh, so that we may inshallah be worthy of the intercession of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam truly inwardly as well as just formally and outwardly members of his ummah. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Taqabbal Allah siyamana wa qiyamana wa ruku'ana wa sujoodana wa tarawihana wa aidana wa takbirana wa a'tinaqina insha'Allah wa a'adahu alayna wa ala al-ummati al-muhammadiyya bil khayri wal awni wal fathi wal barakati wal tawheedi wal wahda insha'Allah. May Allah accept this and accept your aid and accept your fasting, and inshallah make this a time of spiritual breakthrough, inshallah, for you and for all of us, and for our friends, neighbors, family, and the whole ummah, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum, wassalamu alaikum, wa rahmatullah, wa barakatuh.